Dr. Malia Hassan, and I'll be discussing gram-positive cocci with you today. We're going to start with a brief introduction, starting with the gram staining and the bacteria wall morphology, going on to the classification and discussion of case presentation with problem-based learning. As we know, bacteria can be classified into gram-positive or gram-negative based on their staining characteristics. And the most important and the most easier way to do that is gram staining. It, you, you take the bacteria and stain it with crystal violet. All the bacteria will take up the purple or the bluish stain, which is fixed using the potassium iodide solution. After that, the stain is washed out with water and alcohol. And based on that, if the stain does not come out, the bacteria If the stain is washed out and the bacteria are stained reddish with the saffron and counter staining, those are the gram negative bacteria. Now, this brings us to a very um, important discussion of the bacteria cell walls, which is a hallmark of discussion here. Um, you see that there's a difference in the gram positive and the gram negative bacteria morph cell wall morphology. They both have a plasma membrane surrounded by a cell wall composed of the peptidoglycan cell layer. However, in the gram negative, there is an additional outer membrane and the peptidoglycan layer is relatively thinner. When you talk about gram-positive bacteria holding on to that purple stain it's due to the thick peptidoglycan layer, which is much more cross-linking as compared to the negative bacteria. Also, when you wash out this, um, this, this, the stain with alcohol, the thin outer membrane of the gram-negative bacteria is washed out, and this allows the purple stain to leak, allowing for the counter staining with the red saffronin. And this is the differentiation in the staining characteristics. Also, when you look at the cell wall and you look at the cell membrane of the gram positive, you see that there's protein embedded in that. And these proteins are very important when it comes to penicillin resistance, which we'll talk about when we talk about the treatment of bacterial cell infections. Gram positive bacteria can also be classified depending upon their shape. They can be rods, they can be spheres, or they can be branching filaments. However, we are discussing the spherical bacteria today, which are also known as the cocci. They can be classified depending upon their appearance, either appearing as clusters of spheres, spheres known as staphylococcus or appearance in chains known as streptococcus. These are differentiated on the basis of the catalase test. The catalase test allow, is an enzyme that allows the staphylococcus to hydrolyze hydrogen peroxide in and that's why staphylococcus are catalyst positive, whereas catalyst negative organisms are the streptococci. Once we look at the staphylococcus, we also have to look at the coagulase test. Staph aureus is coagulase positive. Coagulase is an enzyme that, and this allows it to hold on to its infection and contain it. However, staphylococci can be called coagulase negative as well. And when we look at those, they are differentiated on the basis of no abysin sensitivity. All right, moving on. So first we're gonna, as we talked about the identification of the gram-positive cocci, the first species we're gonna look at is the staphylococcus. We already know that it's, the name staphylococcus itself means spheres, spheres like grape-like structures. And if you look at staph aureus, aureus means gold. And we, as we said, the hallmark of differentiation is the coagulase test. Talking of the Staphylococcus aureus, let's talk about the virulence factors of the Staphylococcus aureus. Most important is the protein A, which is found in the cell wall. Protein A attaches to the FC portion of the IgG, and this helps it to disable those antibodies. Essentially, it stops the process of opsonization, so the bacteria cannot be eaten up by the macrophages. It has also some important exotoxins. Exotoxins are essentially secreted into the environment by the Staphylococcus, and this can be classified into the exfoliating toxin, the PV, but that destroys the white cells, or the TSSTI, or the toxic shock syndrome toxin. It also has important enzymes which allow it to penetrate through the tissue and spread very quickly. Some of these are known as hyaluronidase that destroys the connective tissue, allowing it to infect joints. And the skin as well, hemolysine is the enzyme that allows us to destroy the RBCs. Coagulase is another enzyme that allows it to 
degrade the clot formation as well as staphylokinase that it, uh, coagulase is the one that allows it to form clots actually and that is the hallmark of staphylococcus leading to abscess formation it can contain its infection in layers of the skin leading to very pinpoint location staphylokinase on the other hand allows it to dissolve the clot and spread through the tissues rapidly now once we talk about cephalo or cephalococcus aureus it's an it's the bacteria that likes to adhere to a damaged skin mucosa or the tissue surfaces and when it's at these sides it releases its um enzymes and its toxins trying to evade the defensive mechanisms of the host and leading to cause of tissue damage it can produce um, infection by multiplying in the tissues and stimulating the inflammation process, causing cytokine release as well. So staphylococcus can cause cutaneous infections, which can be folliculitis, like we discussed before, inflammation of the hair follicles. As you see in this picture, there are small reddish bumps on the skin. And if this happens sometimes around the eyelid, these are known as the sty. Now, once folliculitis spreads through the skin and they can collect together to form a furuncle and more widespread infection is known as carbuncles, like I said in the previous slide. Deeper infections from the skin can spread via the blood and infect the bones known as osteomyelitis. The clinical features of osteomyelitis would be pain, fever, swelling, and a localized deformity. This can sometimes cause defective healing as well. And you have to kind of debride the wound and drain the pus. The diagnosis is made on x-rays, MRI, and bone aspirates and culture tell us of the causative organisms. Once the cephalococcus aureus spread through the body via the bloodstream, it can also infect the um, valves of the heart. Endocarditis can also result, which is an inflammation of the inner layer of the heart known as the endocardium. The bacteria try to lodge and pile up on the valves and lead to damage on the valves. It, it causes a very acute infection and it quickly damages the valves. It can present as high-grade fever as well as um, cardiac failure and murmurs. Now let's start looking at the toxin-mediated diseases. Um, one of the toxins that's produced by the Staphylococcus aureus is, is an exotoxin A which, forms food, which causes food poisoning. This results from ingestion of a pre-formed enterotoxin. Once the food is cooked and it is handled by um, infected hands that haven't been washed, it can lead to um, a very rapidly, um, gastro a picture of a very rapid gastroenteritis. It usually presents within the first one to eight hours. We can have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and generalized malaise and fever. Uh, vomiting is a hallmark of this kind of um, food poisoning because once it attaches to the lining of the intestine, it sends a message to the vomiting center of the brain to, leading to profuse vomiting. And the types of food involved in staphylococcal food poisoning are usually carbohydrate rich foods such as cakes, pastries, or milk-based products. Another kind of disease that it causes is exfoliative disease due to its exfoliating toxin. The exfoliating toxin cause the separation of the layers of the skin. This, this is because in the stratum granulosum of the layer, it causes um, damage to the desmoglein one, which holds the layers together. This is usually seen in neonates because they have relatively low immune systems. And it is also known as a staphylococcus skin scaldic syndrome because the skin separates off in very thin layers and exposing red mucosa from underneath. The epidermal toxin that is produced is carried by the bloodstream as well. Um, and then can be pretty fatal in neonates. Um, another important toxin secreted by this bacteria is a toxic shock syndrome toxin, also known as TSSD1. Now these are pyrogenic toxins, which means they can cause fever, but their hallmark is that they're super antigens. Like the diagram explains, the super antigens bind to the MHC class two molecules on which are present on macrophages, and these lead to stimulation of a bunch of T cell um, by linking through the T-cell receptors. This activates a cytokine strong, which means that there's a milieu of interleukin-1, 6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which leads to inflammation, tissue injury, and eventually a septic shock kind of a situation. Here is, um, you see that there's a lot of T-cells being activated at the same time. It can lead to the damage to the endothelium, causing the capillary leakage. There's damage to the liver, and then 
the polymorph, the nucleosides, the white bloods are activated and they're recruited, leading to inflammation and shock. The toxic shock syndrome can present as um, a multi-system illness. It can be a high fever with headache and vomiting, diarrhea. It can lead to hypertension. There's um, skin rashes and kidney failure. A rapidly deteriorating situation can lead to septic shock pretty quickly. Now we're going to look at the coagulase negative staphylococcus. There are two important ones, the staphylococcus epidermidis and staphylococcus saprophyticus. Um, novacin sensitivity is what differentiates between the, these two because they're both coagulase negative. So staph epidermidis is novacin sensitive. The hallmark of this bacteria is that it can form biofilms. It commonly live on the skin, but once um, you have any, like an indwelling catheter or um, central IV lines, it can penetrate through. It can penetrate through the skin and spread, especially in people with immunocompromised um, situations. Um, this can also be seen in patients with prosthetic joints or with prosthetic heart valves. Saprophyticus is usually seen in um, females as um, as a urinary tract infection because these can these are commonly found in the urinary tract and can present, the urinary tract infections can present with fever and the flank pain, pain when urinating. Sometimes it can even lead to blood-tinged urine. Um, that's um, all about the Staphylococcus bacteria. We're gonna discuss a case just to summarize um, some of the important presentation, presenting points. So a 56-year-old male is admitted to a hospital with a three-day history of weakness and fatigue. His past history is significant for IV drug use, previously hospitalized for bacteremia due to appearance of elitis of bilateral lower extremities and osteomyelitis, attributed to extensive ongoing IV drug injection through the lower extremity veins. Physical exam is significant for an altered mental status, bilateral lower extremity wounds, the splinter hemorrhages that are noted on the fingernails. Now, when you're looking at this, you see that there is a history of IV drug use, there is history of purulent cellulitis on bilateral lower extremities. And there is um, fatigue, there's pain, and there's splinter hemorrhages that are noted on the fingernails. Once you conduct labs on this kind of a case, you will see that there's elevated white blood cell counts. There's a low hemoglobin, which shows that there's red blood cells destruction, as well as a low platelet count, showing that there's platelet destruction as well. So IV drug abuse, along with cellulitis should bring your attention to staphylococcus aureus infections, usually seen because uh, of a spreading of infection from a localized IV drug site. This can cause, this um, usually causes damage to the tricuspid valves and you uh, leading to bacterial endocarditis. And that's what we're seeing here, the splinter hemorrhages on fingernails, a hallmark of bacterial endocarditis. Once it has spread um, through the heart and through the bloodstream, it can rapidly lead to a toxic shock syndrome and septic shock like we discussed because of the secretion of the TSST1 toxin. The imaging studies in this patient is showing a bilateral pneumonia, pulmonary nodules with cavitation, um, the, no, the lobular uh, collection of pus showing cavitation is a hallmark of staphylococcus aureus again. Um, the endocarditis and vegetation on the valves can send emboli to the brain. And as we see, the CT head will show cerebral infarcts, right? Like, like it is showing in this picture right here. Now, um, the echocardiogram here shows mitral vegetations in this gray arrow right here and tricuspid vegetations right over here. Now, Staphylococcus aureus causes an acute endocarditis, which can cause damage to the mitral or the aortic valve. But usually in IV drug abuse, we usually see vegetation on the tricuspid valve. All right. Um, the second group, group of cocci that we're going to talk about are the streptococci. The streptococci on gram staining are going to be, again, the same blue or the purple color, but they're classified on basis of Brown's classification, Lansfield group, or the Griffith typing. The Brown's classification looks at the hemolytic ability of the streptococci. It can be beta hemolytic, gamma alpha, or gamma hemolytic. What we do is we grow the bacteria on blood agar overnight and we see the kind of hemolysis it can do. Now, in case of beta hemolytic, it can, it's a clear hemolysis. It destroys the red blood cells and produces an area of clearing on the petri dish. 
but if it's alpha hemolytic, which means partial hemolysis, we see a greenish coloration on the petri dish because of the presence of a hemoglobin metabolite and um, partially destroyed red blood cells. And if you don't see any hemolysis, these are known as gamma hemolytic. The bacteria are the enterococcus, E. fecalis, and E. feci. And whereas alpha hemolytic, we have two important groups, the pneumonia and the viridins. And they're differentiated on the basis of optogen, uh, optogen sensitivity and bile solubility. Um, beta hemolysis has group A biogenes and agalecte both produce beta hemolysis and they're differentiated on the basis of the bacitrescent sensitivity, biogenes being sensitive and the agalecte being resistant. Here's the hemolysis, the alpha is greenish, the beta is a complete hemolysis showing an area of clearing and gamma is no hemolysis. They can also be classified on the basis of the Lansfield grouping. Lansfield grouping takes uh, a look at the C carbohydrate present in the cell wall of the streptococcus and can be divided from um, group A to, sorry, group A to through S. The beta hemolytic bacteria have a group A um, Lansfield group classification and a group B. And the non-hemolytic um, bacteria have the group D classification. Strep pneumonia and strep viridins do not have a Lansfield lens grouping. This is a gram sending picture of the cocci. The hallmark is that they're lined up in a chain, like buttons lined up, and um, this is how streptococcus will look on a gram stain. Let's talk about the group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. It is also known as streptococcus pyogenes. Pyogenes means um, pus producing um, bacteria. The cultural and biochemical characteristics are that they're aerobes or facultative anaerobes, which means they can provide with oxygen or without oxygen. They produce small colonies with complete hemolysis around them, also known as beta hemolysis. Like we said, they're bacitrocin sensitive and bile soluble as well. The important antigenic structure of um, strep pyogenes is the C-carbohydrate, which is the basis of the landscape classification, and the M-protein is a major virulence factor. The M-protein prevents, prevents the bacteria from uh, being phagocytosed. It also inhibits the activation of the complement, allowing it to cause a widespread infection in the body. However, the plasma cells of the beta cells can generate proteins against these um, anti-M uh, anti -M proteins against um, the M protein factors. A very important cause of um, the non separative infections of strep pyogenes is the cross reactivity between certain antigens of um, the heart and the renal tissue and these protein antibodies, as we'll discuss later in the disease processes of this enzyme. Um, strep pyogenes also uh, produces an important. Um, Toxin known as strept uh, streptolysin O. Streptolysin O, where O stands for oxygen label, is the hallmark of the hemolysis. It, this is what allows the bacteria to cause the destruction of the red blood cells and the white blood cells. It is also antigenic. It can stimulate the body to produce and uh, the immune system to produce antibodies, which are known as ASO antibodies, um, and these develop following a recent infection and. Um, usually you will see in clinical practices that ASO titers are very important to confirm recent infection. It also produces a pyrogenic exotoxin. Um, the pyrogenic exotoxin allows it to cause um, fever, um, which, is an, which, which is an important um, hallmark of scarlet fever seen in children. It's, uh, it, it, it has a presentation of a red rash on the trunk and the extremities and the face is usually spared. It has other enzymes as well, such as streptokinase, DNAs, and hyaluronidase. The streptokinase allows it to dissolve clots. DNAs allows it to have destruction of the DNA, whereas hyaluronidase is um, the enzyme that allows it to destroy the connective tissue and spread through the joints. Now, the pathogenicity of strep pyogenes is divided into separative diseases and non-separative diseases. It can infect the respiratory tract or the infect or the skin. And like I said, it can cause scarlet fever um, due to the um, production of the pyogenic toxin. Um, when we look at the skin infection, you see that it, they're very similar to the ones caused by the staph aureus. However, necrotizing fasciitis is an important infection and uh, which is caused by um, stre uh, strep pyogenes. 
Um, the non-separative sequel of um, this infection has been rheumatic fever and rhinonephritis. This is due to the protection of the antibodies against the M protein. As I said, necrotizing fasciitis is a life-threatening disease. This is due to the um, M type of strep pyogenes, type 1 and type 3. They form a pyogenic exotoxin A, and it has a high fatality. It allows the bacteria to spread through the fascia, separating the skin and the muscle. Eventually, over days, it can also spread to the muscle, causing myositis. Hence, it is known as a flesh-eating bacteria. Once it spreads through the muscle layer into the blood, it can lead to shock or um, disseminated intravascular coagulation, where the immune system leads to um, destruction of the blood cell components, as well as multiple clotting. Treatment with penicillin is usually not very effective, and vancomycin is a drug of choice in this life-threatening disease. Now, the non-separative sequelae of um, strep pyogenes for acute rheumatic fever, um, usually it begins with an infection in the throat. Prior sensitization to the bacteria is essential, and it can be a, any serotype, causes a marked immune response, but the complement level stay, uh, remains unaffected. There is an acceptability in individuals. Usually repeated attacks over um, several years lead to um, the presentation of acute rheumatic fever. Usually you see a history of um, a child developing multiple um, throat infections of pharyngitis due to strep pyogenes or the strep throat, as we call it. And um, untreated infection over years can lead to myocarditis which will eventually lead to damaging of the heart valves and present, presenting with a fever. The hallmark of acute rheumatic fever is um, um, joint involvement, um, subcutaneous skin nodules, um, chorea, which is uh, sudden um, movements, and there's um, um, fever as well. It's usually you have to give these um, children penicillin for profile access to prevent them from repeated attacks. Another hallmark of non-separative infection is acute glomerulonephritis. Again, it starts off as um, usually seen in children as a pharyngitis or um, known as strep throat or a localized upper respiratory infection, which leads to um, a moderate immune response. The complement level is lowered. And over repeated attacks, we will see that it leads to infection of the basement membrane of the glomerulus, leading to um, the picture of um, glomerulonephritis. However, penicillin prophylaxis is not indicated. This is not a chronic disease that happens over um, a long period of time. Acute glomerulonephritis usually presents within weeks of infection of the throat. The next group of bacteria that we're going to talk about are the Streptococcus agalecte. These usually cause neonatal infections. Streptococcus agalecte is a part of the normal vaginal flora, and as the child passes through the, through the birth canal, it can lead to infection in the child that is less than three months of, old, uh, three months of age. It can lead to neonatal meningitis. It can also cause purple sepsis and pneumonia in the mother. And the diagnostic markers of Streptococcus agalecte is the CAM test or the hypoid hydrolysis. The group D Streptococcus were the part of the non-hemolytic um, um, Streptococcus. And the two important groups are Enterococcus and the um, a strep bovis. Enterococcus has E. faecalis and E. faecium. These are part of the normal bowel flora, and the hallmark is that they can um, survive in a certain concentration of bile, which, which makes them um, an important cause of biliary tract infection. They're also responsible for UTI, and another thing known as subacute bacterial endocarditis. They can cause um, them, they can cause infection previously damaged heart valves, such as um, the heart valves damaged by rheumatic fever, or if there's a mitral valve prolapse. This infection is subacute, meaning it's not as rapidly presenting as an endocarditis that is caused by staphylococcus, as we discussed previously. As far as the non enterococci are concerned, it is important to remember that S. bovis is has a remarkable association with colon cancer. Um, usually 50% of the patients who have a history of colonic carcinoma have S. bovis present in their intestinal tract. 
like I said, the special features of the group D were that they can be pre they can grow in the presence of 40% bile and as well as sodium chloride, and they make magenta colonies on McConkie agar, and they are largely non-hemolytic. Another group of important bacteria are the viridins group. Viridins means green, and these are um, part of the alpha hemolytic group. Streptococca, these are normally found in the mouth and um, in the tissues of the gum. Um, they do not have a classification based on the Lansfield antigenic group. However, there are several different types, mitis, mutant, salivaris, and sanguis. Strep the mutants group is important because it causes dental caries. It ferments the sugar that is found on the teeth and it can lead to um, dental caries. How, and also tooth extraction can cause seeding of these bacteria into the bloodstream and these can travel to the heart leading to infection of the endocardium. So usually in patients that have a prior history of um, damaged valves or prosthetic heart valves, we want to give prophylactic antibodies before we have any dental procedures done. Streptococcus pneumonia is Lansfield shaped cocci are found in pairs and there are 90 different serotypes. The most important virulence factor of these, the, uh, this kind of a bacteria is the polysaccharide capsule. This capsule protects the organism from phagocytosis. It is also antigenic and it is the basis of the separation of the ammonia into several different serotypes. It also leads, it is the capsular antigen that leads to the production of type specific antibody and this has helped in the production of a vaccine against this bacteria. Streptococcus pneumonia can be identified on the basis of a Quelling's reaction or optogen sensitivity. Quelling's reaction is when you take an anti-serum and you expose the bacteria to it. This will cause us, um, the, the capsule around the, the bacteria to swell up and it can be seen under the microscope. And optogen sensitivity is when you um, place a disc of optogen on the media and see that the bacteria can grow or the growth is inhibited by optogen. What are the determinants of pathogenicity in streptococcus pneumonia? The polysaccharide capsule, like I said, is important. It also has a surface protein A, which allows it to adhere to the mucosal surfaces of the nose and the mouth and the throat. The enzymes, such as neuramidase and the proteases, allow it to cleave certain tissues and invade the mucosa and destroy the antibodies, making it more um, virulent. It also produces toxins, such as pneumolysin O and autolysin which allow it to destroy the red blood cells and the respiratory epithelium. The toxins activate the complement leading to widespread inflammation. The autolysin causes the bacteria to kind of um, disintegrate and release the proteases. The types of infection caused by strep pneumonia or pneumonia itself, meningitis, and otitis media in children. Um, it, uh, in case of pneumonia, it is notorious for causing damage to the alveoli and leading to accumulation of um, pus and um, red blood cells and white, dead white blood cells in the tissues of the lung leading to um, infection. It will present as fever, shivering, chest pain, and usually chest x-ray is positive for um, consolidation in the lobules. Um, all right. This brings us do another case study. We're going to try and see how a streptococcal infection can present. Uh, we're going to look at a patient who is 50 year old. Um, he has AIDS, which means he's immunocompromised. He's presenting with a high fever of 103, which has been worsening for three weeks. It started off as a sore throat and led to a neck swelling. He's, he took penicillin and he noted that the penicillin um, improved its, his, his symptoms. But once he ran out of his medicine, his symptoms worsened and he developed fever with chills and sore throat and the swelling in the neck returned. There is no history of dental work and he's been taking his regular medication. So in the emergency room, when we checked, the blood pressure was low. A low, a low blood pressure is usually a hallmark of um, shock developing. Physical examination is notable for a swollen neck. And you can see that there's spreading cellulitis on the skin of the neck and the chest as well. Now, when you look at the lab values, you will see that there's an increased white blood count and a predominance of neutrophils on the peripheral smear, which means that there is an infection that's causing um, the white blood cells to um, 
aggregate together in the bloodstream. Now the CD scan of the neck shows an abscess um, that is causing the neck to bulge on physical um, appearance. Now this can be a life-threatening infection because it can compress the trachea that can um, that is the breathing that's the airway and um, the enlarging abscess can obstruct um, uh, the, the patient's breathing. Now, how do you diagnose the infection? An aspiration of the abscess um, is, uh, you know, um, is examined under the microscope and a gram staining is done and it shows that it's gram positive for cocci in short chains. So this shows you that it's um, strep streptococcus. Now, when you do culture of the media, um, then you do culture, you see that it is, it's, it's having an intense beta hemolysis that is clearing of the blood, out, blood agar on the plate. And you can see that the plate that is normally um, has blood, it is completely opaque. So what are the questions that come to you? So a milder form of this disease is known as strep throat and it causes pharyngitis. So what bacteria is coming to your mind when you look at this? So like we said, a pyo strep pi um, pyogenes, which is a pus producing bacteria causes pharyngitis. However, in an immunocompromised person, it can spread and lead to a widespread infection. Like in this case, it is causing an abscess in the throat. Some of the questions that they can ask you on the basis of this case scenario in any exam would be how do you uh, what is the basis of classification of the streptococcus? And like we said, they can be classified on the basis of the hemolytic pattern or the basis of the C carbohydrate present in the cell wall. And another classification is the Griffith classification, which allows you to classify the bacteria on the basis of the M protein. Um, so we also discussed this type of where streptococcus can cause separated and non-separated non consequences. So in this case, what do you think the case is presenting with? And it's, it's not an acute, it's not a chronic presentation, it's presenting with an acute picture. So it's a separative infection. The non separative sequel was the glomerulonephritis and the rheumatic fever. Um, another case study is of a seven year old boy with a sore throat and fever. And he's presenting with his mother to the pediatrician with an erythematous throat and enlarged cervical lymph nodes. His strep throat was positive. However, 10 days later, he develops hematuria, puffy eyelids, and swollen ankles, spitting edema of his feet, and a blood pressure of 165 over 100. So, an elevated blood pressure and edema explains that there's something wrong with his kidneys. As pressure is applied on the shin and indentation of the skin remains for several seconds, this shows that there's fluid accumulation in the subcutaneous space. Now, once you, once you look at the lab work, it shows you. Urinalysis has protein urea as well as RBC uh, cal cal serum cre creatinine is elevated, showing that the kidney function is affected. And looking at the blood picture, you see that there is um, anti DNA titer is elevated and C3 complement is reduced. However, the throat culture is negative. So this means that this is a sequel of, this, of, this, of the sore throat that led to and a picture of acute glomerular nephritis. And like we said, this is a diagnosis. He had a sore throat due to streptococcus pyogenes that led to, eventually led to glomerulonephritis in this case. In this um, case, and the two important non-separative complications are the same. Like we said, glomerulonephritis or rheumatic fever. And here, here we can talk about the significance of the M antigen. The M antigen is antigenic and produces antibodies, and these antibodies can also attack the antigens of the heart valves as well as the antigens in the, in the glomerular basement membrane and the glomerulus of the kidney. And in this case, it is, it is leading to a picture of glomerular nephritis. Um, the, and the classification that is used on the basis of M antigen is the Griffith classification. Now to summarize our um, discussion, we see that the staph and the streptococcus um, bacteria, the gram-positive cocci cause similar infection. That is, that is why it is important to know their morphology on the basis of the staining and their cultural growth, because once you are presented with similar kind of pictures, you will have to deduct on the basis of your lab test, the blood culture, what kind of bacteria it is, because that will lead to um, it will lead to a proper treatment with the proper kind of antibiotics since it's a different treatment pattern for both the bacteria. That brings us to an end to the discussion. Thank you so much. I hope this was helpful.